behalf of the Emerge Africa Professional Development Network, it's a great pleasure to welcome everybody here, the editors and the authors of this very important work, and everybody who's come along to hear about it and to celebrate the launch as well. I know that this book is going to be cited for many years and is going to be a significant resource for many of the courses which are um, being run post-grad to train future generations of educational technologists and educationalists. Before I say anything else, um, I would note that Captions have been enabled, so you can at the bottom of your Zoom screen decide to show captions. Some of the results of the captions are extremely bizarre, but they might help you anyway. And now it's a great pleasure to introduce the editors of the book. Pindila Zifikila Shangase, Senior Lecturer in the Faculty of Health Sciences at University of Free State, South Africa. Um, she has over 10 years of teaching, supervision, and research experience in higher education. Daniela Gachago, who is an associate professor in the Center for Innovation in Learning and Teaching at um, University of Cape Town. And her research focuses on academic staff development to transform teaching and learning in higher education. And Eunice Indeto Ivala, who is an associate professor and director of the Center for Innovative Educational Technology at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology, located in Cape Town, South Africa. Eunice is passionate about staff development into mainstreaming technology in learning and teaching. Um, the slide obviously shows you further information about the illustrious editors. And now I'm very happy to hand over to the editors to introduce our program for today. Thank you, Tony, and thank you everyone who could join us today. Um, I'm so happy to see all of you here. You made it from all over the world, which is beautiful. Um, so we are we have about an hour and a half together and we are trying to not just have presentation but a little bit of engagement and conversations and um and 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 yes relationship building <laughs> as our book is all about so we will introduce the book very briefly and then we have four um four authors who um who volunteered to share their, their chapters with us very briefly, just to get, so you get a sense of the chapters. And then we have some time in breakout rooms where you can actually visit either one or more of the authors to ask specific questions, share your experiences. So also the authors who are not presenting today, will have time to share their chapters in the breakout rooms. And the breakout rooms will be um, categorized by teaching research and community engagement. So you can join the breakout room you're most interested in. And then we have a bit of a conversation, collective harvesting what happened in the breakout room. So you can also understand what the conversations that have happened in the other rooms. And then we were hoping <laughs> to have an external respondent, Gabriel Konyoma, who has written a book review um, for mm -hmm. the South African Journal of Science. He hasn't arrived yet. I'm hoping he will arrive in time. And then Prof. Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams, who wrote the foreword for the book, will um, conclude the session and um, talk about like what are the gaps in the book. And then we'll just have a thank you and a closing by the editors. So that is the program for today. We'll see how, how far we come and what will happen. This is really an informal, we are not that many. This is an informal space and hopefully a space for a lot of new connections and relationships to be built. But to start with, I will hand over to my colleague, Pindila, who can talk about the origins of the book. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, colleagues, I'll just be quite brief, hopefully. So um, I was involved in a project 
with the University of Botswana. It's a partnership project that I fundraise for, and we work together to set up a virtual classroom uh, via the learning management system known as Moodle. And we, it was a pilot project where we were co-teaching research methods to master students, meaning that my colleagues, as well as colleagues at the University of Botswana, taught together students from UK, the then University of KwaZulu-Natal, and those from the University of Botswana. So we had about 10 students, five from each university. And what I learned about co-teaching from that partnership was wonderful. You know, with regard to sharing uh, the skills, sharing knowledge, and students as well from different contexts interacting. However, of course, there were some other uh, sides, you know, uh, like with lack of uh, proper technology infrastructure and so on and so forth, but it all worked out well. And then I thought, why, why don't I, I just write about this so that everyone knows exactly what's going on and what the experiences we have within co-teaching. Um, then I approached Daniela with the book concept. And I was so glad that uh, she accepted and included Eunice as well. Um, so we sat down, I visited Cape Town, and we sat down to, you know, refine the book concept. And uh, I just want to thank them, to be honest, colleagues, to all of you who are here as professors. <laughs> I'm just saying these two professors took off their heads for me said, let's listen. Oh, this is great, Pindile. Let's run with it. I was really honored. I'm still honored to have worked with them. I've learned a lot from them. And I really thank them for listening to uh, the book concept that I had at hand. And then we ran on with it. And uh, I won't say more. Daniela will just say a little bit about the call uh, for abstract, you know, throughout the world and how we sat down to review everything, how much time we spent, but it was all well done. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Pindila. Yeah, so from this very chance encounter at CPT <laughs> in December 2019, I don't even know who brought us together. I think some colleagues and the faculty of informatics and design said there is this lady who is visiting and she's doing similar work to yours. Why don't you just chat to her? And that's how it started. And often these collaborations start like that with these really chance encounters and you meet somebody and an idea is born and you run with it. And that's how this book happened. We approached publishers and Vernon, who units had worked with before, would, said, yeah, they're interested in the book idea. It sounds interesting. We wrote a proposal. We sent out the call for interest. And then we had, I think, over nearly 60 um, expressions of interest, 60 abstracts that were submitted. But Again, I guess because the definition of co-teaching in our book is quite specific, and we'll talk about that, a lot of the papers actually did not fall into that um, definition, and we had to unfortunately um, you know, reject the, the, the abstract. But at the end, we had five, 15 chapters in the book, over 40 authors. We were very clear that we wanted collaboration, collaborative, collective, paired writing. There's no single author chapter in here. All of the chapters are co-authored with the partners in the co-teaching or co-research um, projects. And we have partners from all over the world. We have predominantly partners from South Africa, but also from the African continent, from Europe, um, from China, the US. Here, yeah, this is just a geographical, <laughs> it's a map. So we have a lot of authors from South Africa. I mean, clearly that is our network. That's where the idea stemmed from. But all these South African partners had partners, or most of them had partners across the world. So we have people in the US, with people in the UK, in Egypt, in Kenya, in Uganda, in Brazil, in Australia, and in New Zealand. That's a really nice spread. Different kind of higher education institution, community um, partnerships, um, industries, a real big mix of partners that have worked together. And I think what's really important to say about the book, and I can't say it open enough, it's open access. So we really, really fought for it to be open access. So it's available to everyone. Um, you can just download the PDF document. Mm -hmm. And in terms of topics and themes emerging, it's a really colorful and very diverse mix of experiences of co-teaching and co-researching. Um, 
And the focus is not so much, although it was born from the idea of using technology to support these co-teaching, mm -hmm. co-researching partnership, what came out very strongly that the, the, all the chapters are really less about technology and more about the how we work together, which we actually thought is a big gap in the literature at the moment. How do we work together across contexts that are so unequal, that are so different, whether it's technological access, the resources, but also culturally, how people, how things are being done. How do we, how do we overcome these differences? How do we work together? So it's a lot of personal accounts and experiences um, from people's um, practice of either creating co-teaching opportunities or co-researching or working with the communities. And very much it's about foregrounding relationship and community building. That was something that I found really interesting because more and more, you know, when we talk about using technology, it's not so much about the technology anymore. It's really about embracing it's building relationship, it's building trust, and the technology is a tool that can allow that building of trust. But what really counts is the relationships that you build as you work together. And that takes time. And I think a lot of these chapters also speak about how, you know, you need time to sustain connection, the reflection on the process so that you can improve and continue working. It's a combination of evidence-based, there's some very like straightforward. Um, empirical studies, but it's a lot also about, uh, it's a lot of autoethnographic research in there too, so narratives of the people involved, reflective and reflexive contribution, which is a really interesting mix of things. Um, and I love the question that Mahapali poses in her afterward, where she also reflects on her own experiences of working together with mostly the global north from a global south perspective, and it's really, this is the kind of the, the question that should frame, you know, or that I think would be really useful for all of you to think about when you read the book is as you read through these chapters and you can dip in and dip out. There's no need to say, you don't have to read from chapter one to the end. You just pick what you're interested in. But what are the kind of messages that resonated most with you? How might you approach collaboration differently now? That is really what we are trying to do to create a space where we can reflect what works, but also what didn't work. There's some very critical pieces in there as well to see how can we improve working together? What is it that we usually don't think about, but that is really important to think about when we work across this context of inequality? Um, Eunice, we will go into more depth when we speak about individual chapters, so you get a sense of what the chapters are all about. But before we go there, I just want to ask, my colleague Eunice, to share a few thoughts just about the idea of co of editing, you know, co-editing books. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Pindile and Daniela, and also Tony for introducing us, and Daniela for briefly sharing with the, the attendees on, and the, uh, I think everybody who is here, except the editors were, were co-authors in the work. I would like to thank you for making time to be with us and celebrating with us uh, this launch. I thought I should just share my experiences about uh, editing books. This is my fifth edited volume um, and I've edited two conference proceedings. And I felt uh, I should say words of encouragement and also share uh, issues on relationships because the book is also about relationships. Um, in the country, I don't know, because we all come from different countries. In, in, in South Africa, a lot of people, uh, academics, don't like editing books. And there are reasons why they don't do it. Some of the reasons are, at times, people don't have the ability to do so, because uh, it is an art, or you can call it a science, uh, you need to know how to go about uh, coming up with the idea and the proposal and all what is needed to actually actualize a book. Then uh, the work involved, there's a lot of work involved to have a book. And I think people would just opt to write an article and forgo that. The burning issue is the no subsidy for edited books. As an editor, you don't get subsidy from the government. Um, 
uh, if you have a book in the in the chapter in the in the in a chapter in the book, you don't get a subsidy. Except now, I saw this year that uh, if you have a chapter and it was not reviewed by any of the editors, uh, you can be considered for subsidy. And I think this is really something which discourages a lot of uh, people from uh, editing volumes because everybody really wants to advance in their research careers and they need to get money to be able to go to conferences and all that. But uh, I want to encourage people to actually edit books um, because there is, uh, uh, um, for, for, for us just to go for subsidy, it's just thinking about ourselves, uh, selfishness and all that. But uh, to edit a book, it's, there's a lot of sacrifice and a lot of good that comes with it. For example, a lot of authors, and I'm not saying the authors who are here, I'm, I'm giving my experiences for the work I've been involved in, are people you need to develop into writing and all that. Uh, and for me, that is more important. And these people, you develop them at the end of the day, there's a book and they get subsidy. And then the other thing I need to say is the impact of the book at the end of the day. You may not get subsidy, but this book, as Tony said, will be read globally, quoted. It will impact practices in not only in South Africa, but globally for those who find it of interest. And for me, I want to encourage you and tell you that uh, the value of the book uh, uh, in terms of developing colleagues and in terms of the impact it has on practices nationally and globally is more important than any subsidy. So feel encouraged to go through the pain that comes with because you leave a legacy in this world with what you've put together in the, in the book as, as editors or, or prospective editors, because I'm encouraging people to get into it. In terms of relationships, it's, it's a long, it takes long. You have to have an idea, write a proposal, pitch to, to send it to the publishers. If they like it, it's reviewed. And then there's the, the sending of calls and, and getting the chapters and reviewing. And within that uh, uh, period, things happen. Editors get sick, uh, call, call, uh, others get sick, and we get, we get stuck in issues of, please give me time uh, for me to edit. Please give me time for, 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 for me to finish the paper. And I'm just saying that uh, uh, we need to, uh, this is where, uh, when, the process of writing and all that, uh, where things like the 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 the, the pedagogies of care, um, um, uh, humanizing pedagogies, we need really to apply them when we start working collaboratively in a book project, or can it can also be applied in working together in collaborative projects because you will need each other. This time I might be, uh, uh, for example, I was sick for most of the time. I may be sick. Next time somebody will pick you up. And it happened so many times because my first book, one of the editors got sick. We had to share the work. The second book, uh, we were two editors. My co-editor had a brief man. She couldn't uh, look at the, uh, the whole 17 chapters before we submitted. I did it. And it goes uh, that I can give examples. And what I'm saying is that when we embark in this collaborative work, let's remember pedagogy of care, let's remember um, uh, humanizing pedagogies and really know that we are working with human beings and there will be issues, sicknesses, bereavements, which throw somebody off guard and we have to pick each other. We shouldn't take it as a time of fighting each other and all that. Those are things I have learned and I hope uh, uh, you can learn from them when you embark in this. And sincerely, I would like to thank my co-editors. They really came in for me when I was not able to work or when I needed time, they bared with me. Thank you, uh, Daniela. Thank you, Pindile. I really appreciate all your efforts. Thank you, Daniela. Over to you. Thanks, Yannis. Thank you. So this takes us to the next session um, of, our, of our book launch, which is the sharing of four chapters. And we've got 
uh, colleagues here in the room, Yolanda Moka from Stadio, Nicola Pallet from Rhodes University, and Pauline Guimwa from Kenya. And um, I will also present one chapter that I wrote with colleagues on postgraduate school teaching. But Yolanda will start. Yolanda, you're there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much. Shall I start? Yes, please go ahead. We can't see you though. You can't see me yet. Can't you see me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh yeah, no, I can yeah, see you now. I'm here. Yes. Uh, first, thank you so much. I wish to just thank our um, brilliant um, editors, uh, also Emerge, for, for providing this fantastic opportunity for everybody um, participating, my co authors, um, the whole um, amazing team. Um, this chapter prompted us four authors across three continents to explore and discover four design principles for connected co-learning and co-teaching in online and blended global architecture studios. Now, at the time of writing, our respective architecture studios um, and schools in Cape Town, Brisbane, Kampala and Lincoln and Perth offered a range of on-ground blended and fully online architecture programs. Um, and these settings really formed the basis or the focus of our uh, shared um, narratives. I just located the, the authors on your map, um, Danella, credits to, to, to your graphic. Um, so then the next slide um, just shows the seven themes um, that emerged um, from our regular online conversations. Uh, during these conversations, we discovered that there were more overlaps and similarities than there were differences unexpectedly, of course, in our context and experiences, uh, there was so much um, that we could, could share. Our conversations, often quite informal, um, revolved around the different ways that we observed and experienced different connections through our shared stories. Um, we, we discovered that the, the, the themes that kept on popping up were connecting online and on-ground spaces, connecting the university and the profession, connecting students and international experts, connecting digital learning and teaching tools, connecting students through peer-to-peer -peer learning, connecting um, educators locally and globally, and finally connecting students um, and educators. Um, and of course, all of these um, connecting themes are interconnected. Then uh, on the next slide, uh, just to show how our discussion themes um, prompted 35 observations, uh, which we synthesized into four design principles. There's really an informal, quite chaotic um, conversations uh, that often dwelled on, on quite personal um, stories and narratives. And, and then, um, so we started our research in the Google Doc and then we had 12 weekly one hour meetings um, where we, we uh, obviously met online and, and, and we just discussed our, our experiences. So these um, four design principles, as you can see on the screen, um, related to the use of technology, um, the importance of student agency and well-being. Uh, it uh, touched on learning settings and modes, the um, multiple interlinked learning settings and modes, and very importantly, the recognition of humanity, humor, culture, and community. I think that links back to what Daniela also said earlier. So finally, what we had learned and what we really, really appreciate from this process was more than the findings of our research. We also found comfort in our regular online meetups. It allowed us to connect on so many different levels and provided relief and comfort during a very, as we all admit, a challenging time of uncertainty and disruption. So just finally, I really want to wish um, uh, I wish to thank the editors for this opportunity um, to share and reinforce these connections um, through this very, very extraordinary publication. It's really been a privilege, a privilege to be part of this process. That's all from me at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. And I just want to mention, I think one of your co-authors is here, isn't it? Isn't Stephen Feast here? Do you want to show your face briefly <laughs> just to say hi? There we go. Thanks, Yolanda. Yes. Well done. <laughs> Good one. Hi, Stephen. Fantastic. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, I, I missed those catch ups. We haven't done them for a while, have we? <laughs> it was so brilliant. We kind of we we had um, yeah we we missed them and we we kind of relied on them. We became so dependent on 
on on this this uh, connection. So yeah, the way the chapter started out was 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 really just about writing what we had done before, and then through the pandemic, obviously it it, it took a whole different um, kind of it it provided so much support for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. It was yeah, it was really good having that um, to the be able to make that connection over the course of the pandemic when we weren't necessarily talking to a lot of other people at the time. Mm -hmm. Exactly, no, and, yeah, and and discovering how much we had in common, uh, mm. it was it was really it was really fun. Yeah. Yes, well, thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thanks, Fantastic. Steven. So I will be very quick. Um, our chapter was also a reflection on a co-teaching, um, a collaboration, but spoken but located in South Africa. And I have seen, I think, one of my co-writers is here too. Simon, do you want to say hi? Hi, is, colleagues. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Hello. Lovely, lovely seeing you. So we, this was a postgraduate diploma that's offered um, across three institutions in the Western Cape. Um, the Stellenbosch University, Sonia, the first author, is part of the Stellenbosch University. Simone is from the University of Western Cape. Faik from CPT and myself, I was at that point when we started writing this paper also at CPT. So I think this is quite a unique program because there are many postgraduate diplomas that are being offered by one institution in South Africa, but as far as I know, this is one of the few postgraduate diplomas that are actually offered across um, three institutions. And it's not an easy um, space to be because the institution, for those who know the Western Cape, are very differently positioned. Um, Stellenbosch is a historically white, Afrikaans-speaking, quite well-resourced institution. While you, the UWC is a formerly you know, colored, um, very politically active, um resistance university during apartheid and cpt is a very new university merged um, out of a number of of technicons um so very very different kind of identities very different um kind of academics or faculty that work there and very different kind of students but we offered this course across um these three institutions and we all taught a course called ict in higher education and at the beginning, we thought, how will we ever create a course that can talk to all of our, you know, all of our participants who have such different um, challenges, different contexts, different focus, access to resources. And then we thought, you know, if we frame it by theories such as design thinking um, and, you know, and, 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 and make it highly contextual and focused on our participants and, and try make it as flexible as possible to accommodate all of these different disciplines and contexts, it might actually work. So what we focus more is rather than being very strict or, or, or um, you know, very, um, very planned, we had a lot of space to actually respond to our participants' needs. So we, we focus a lot of creativity, problem solving, and also resource scarce solutions because we had you know, we had this different context we had to keep in mind. And we found it really important to have blended learning space. So to meet face-to-face -face and online to get to know each other. And we also felt that having challenging activities, challenging our participants to become co-creators with us um, by, you know, developing tasks such as developing lessons, facilitating webinars. Um, they had to do an interview, a video interview with each other. So we actually positioned our participants as experts. They become they, be, they became co um, co um, co creators with us, and we we were using Margaret Archer's culture culture um, structure agency as analytical framework. And the kind of, and and what emerged for us is that really we had to be upfront and very intent on negotiating this this different worldviews that our academics our participants came with. It's very different political and ideological um, 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 standpoints, depending on where they, they were from, from which institution they would join us. And to be highly accommodating and responsive, to um, be aware of these different contexts and not to put them into, um, you know, into competition, but to accept them and recognize them all as valid and important. And as I said, to position our participants as, as experts, to invite them to co-create the space for them, and to be open about embracing these uncertain spaces that we also didn't really know how to respond to. And it was such a learning experience for all of us, especially the feeling of a shared ownership of learning, so that we we, we felt we were we were all 
peers or partners in the in the process of developing this course. So again, a really, really fantastic experience. And I miss that a little bit because at UCT we we have postgraduate diplomas, but we only offer them as one institution. And that kind of interdisciplinary, interinstitutional collaboration was for me one of the most really most exciting bases to be. So this was, um, I'm just trying to see, um, is it Nicola now that next or Pauline? Who wants to go next? I think it's Pauline. Pauline? Yeah, I'm um, fair and I can see our yeah, chapter yeah, is fair. Yeah, yeah go uh, ahead, good please. morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are tuned from. My name is Pauline Gimwa and um, myself together with my other two co-authors we contributed chapter six which focused on exploiting technologies in network designing training and research engagements in african universities and um, we used uh, the organization i work for which is the partnership for african social and governance research as our um our context so what, what we did was um, we, we didn't do an empirical study. Instead, we used critical uh, reflections of our own um, experiences um, mm -hmm. working in a networked environment. PASGA, or this organization, we call it PASGA in short. It's, um, it's, it's really a network, and a lot of what we do, we do within a network environment. So we, we looked at uh, three areas. We looked at um, how we do um, course designs for our uh, graduate education, how we do, um, we, we support training and research. So we were, um, I want to reflect mainly on how we have worked with communities and communities of, by communities, I mean communities of researchers, communities of um, of educators, and communities of um, learners. So, for this particular presentation, I really want to make reflections on the challenges that we 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 observed as uh, we worked uh, within these network communities so that I can draw some of the lessons that we learned, which I'd like to share. So some of the challenges, there were many, they, we, we've experienced um, a, a range of challenges working in network um, communities. And um, one of the, the, the top one, and, and we all know about this is the issue of affordability. Because when you're talking about network networked environment, we're talking about um, using technology and technology can be cheap, but it can also be um, expensive. So some of the challenges related to affordability that we experienced uh, were to do with um, um, access to um, the gadgets themselves, the right infrastructure. We observed particularly our learners and uh, the educators, it's not always that their universities support this. And we know that because most of us here come from Africa. So we know that our universities are not always able to support our learners and our educators. So that became a, a challenge that uh, we observed. The second one was around the issue of capacity, capacity to use technology. So we found that not everyone is comfortable um, working within that environment. Researchers, um, would need to use some of uh, the techno technological uh, tools and apps, but they have to build their capacities to do that. Similarly, our educators and our students would want to use uh, LMS, but uh, not everyone has that um, capacity. But we also saw that uh, capacity from another angle. Uh, we found that a number of our communities have competing demands and they do not always have the capacity to negotiate or navigate uh, along that. 
some of them are full time are in full time teaching others in have a lot of research workloads and really um, navigating through that uh, range sometimes became a challenge then of course there were those ones who did not have the capacity to show discipline to dedicate time and uh, work more effectively within those remote or virtual environments. So that, that we look at capacity, we observe capacity from different uh, perspectives. Mm -hmm. Then the issue of connectivity, which of course is linked to affordability. Not every place that we work in has good connectivity. So as we engaged our learners during training sessions, as we engaged our researchers in collaborative research projects, You'd find issues of technology, sometimes they drop off because they are not well connected, the bandwidth is not there, adequate bandwidth is not there. Also the affordability of internet. And of course, linked to connectivity is the issue of um, uh, power surges. So those are issues that we have observed as we have worked. Then of course, the fast paced technology, technological growth, even for us, um, as uh, the 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 authors and the communities, technology of course is moving very fast, and we have to uh, invest so that uh, we can uh, at least gain the the maximum benefit of this fast paced technology. So we observed that as a challenge, and we have to invest continuously, invest in um, in, in in updating our apps, our technologies so that um, at least uh, we are able to benefit maximally. Collaborating across diverse teams, this for us was actually uh, a major issue because you, are, you, you have different cultures, different ways of doing things, group dynamics, um, geographies, you're working within different time zones. Uh, like I say, we are, we are in, in Africa, but we also have partners uh, uh, across the globe. So when, when Africa is going to sleep, that's when some other parts of the world are waking up and you have to get a, to compromise on some, some, some time. So sometimes you find that if you're if you're dealing with some people, they are waking up early in the morning at six o'clock because you are going to sleep. The only time you're available, you can meet is around six in the evening. So that also became a real challenge. Now, what, what I wanted to say is that um, for us to make these reflections, really we used, um, some, we adopted a framework that um, has been developed uh, by two others where we looked at what technologies are used, where these technologies are used, how the technologies are used, who uses the technologies, where the technologies are used, and when the technologies are used. And because of that, we were able now to draw some lessons out of the reflections that we had we, we, we had. had. And I just want to share just a few of them. The first one is context, sense, context sensitive use of affordable technology. So we, 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 we have, like I've said, some of the challenges we had were to do with technology, with affordability, with connectivity. So we have to look at who are our users and what technology is in their hands that they can harness. So most of our users use, use mobile phones. So how do you then help um, or design whatever it is that you're doing so that it can have um, mobile, you can leverage mobile technology. So like um, when we started designing our LMS, we ensured that it has a mobile technology um, um, interface. So that, that means that the kind of technology that we are using is technology that can easily be accessed by um, our users. Then there's the success of network technologies depends on strong capacity. That's something that we observe. And um, because of that, we started uh, capacity strengthening our communities and really encouraging this. Like for example, when it comes to uh, educators, we initiated a program called uh, Pedagogical uh, Leadership in Africa. It's been a popular um, technology um, uh, project that has equipped the educators with appropriate technologies to be able to, I mean, pedagogies to be able to succeed within um, virtual environments. People need motivation for technology adoption. 
So you have to create meaning. Why is it that people want to use that? And it goes to the framework I've talked about. Why? The why question becomes uh, very critical. If there is enough reason for them to use the technology, they will keep motivated and match the user profile with whatever is available. So this will help you develop technologies. And it, it goes back to my first point, context sensitivity. It will help you be able to, um, once you have mapped the, the users, you'll be able to um, introduce technology that is appropriate, that is context um, relevant. Leveraging mobile technologies, I've already talked about that. Then online communities of practice are effective for online collaboration, but you must incentivize them, not necessarily with money, but with other issues, with other issues. Some of the um, things that we introduced were like uh, attendance to conference. We also took, took on um, uh, into payment of uh, data. So we just give them, you know, support for data facilitation. That way our community of practice remained intact. Then of course, investing in technologies and quality infrastructure that supports virtual collaboration, that is something that we also learned. Now, once you have it right, then um, um, that engagement is well supported. So um, listeners, that's, so those are some of the reflections I wanted to make out of our work. And I believe more will come out during our breakout session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Pauline. That was fascinating. And I know you're doing some amazing work across many different partner organizations, many different contexts. So an expert in supporting this kind of collaboration. So this is now our last chapter we'll introduce, Nicola Pallet from Rhodes, um, who's going to share chapter 11, a big collaboration. <laughs> Yes, there are many of us. Thank you very much, Daniela. And I just want to say in editing the slide, I noticed I cut some words out and some of my colleagues are here. Um, Christy is in the room and so is Leah all the way from Uganda. Christy's in the United States and Nompilo Chuma from Stellenbosch University. And I'm apologies to Nompilo. It seems your name, yeah, Nompilo should name should be here. Um, so yeah, my fellow co-authors and I are part of a research collaborative community between two educational technology professional networks. Uh, if you can just stay on the previous one, please, Daniela. One is based okay. in the US, the AECT, and the other one um, is based in Africa, this very network that is hosting this virtual book launch, the Emerge Africa Network. So while the focus of our particular group is on supporting historically marginalized and underserved learners, our goal is to create an equitable, healthy, strength-based collaborative approach to research. We found a lot of definitions of co-research um, and how these did not acknowledge the complexities involved in co-creating supportive collaborative processes. Few studies investigate collaborative processes and strategies that one can use for building supportive relationships and how to better enable collaboration. So perhaps some of you have prior experience with co-research uh, where you found that traditional research approaches to collaboration were not working, or you felt that there was a need for alternative approaches to enable your collab um, better collaboration in your group. Um, perhaps you and your fellow researchers have experienced some frustrations with communication um, or don't always have shared understandings. You may see a need for co-creating a flexible and equitable space for your fellow co-researchers and if this is something you're thinking about then i think this chapter is for you so we used a team ethnography approach to examine our research practices we argue that interpersonal and process-based principles as you'll see here from our diagram we argue that these go hand in hand and we need to pay close attention to all of these so in our chapter we share our research process and the lenses ethos and practices that we use to design that process. This is followed by emerging principles based on <clears throat> what we have been learning about our own practices to ensure committed and sustained engagement in collaborative research online in South Africa, Uganda, and United States. It is our hope that other collaborative researchers and groups engage with our principles, co-create their own approaches. And if you do, please, please, 
we encourage you to share it with others. And depending on the perspectives and lenses collaborators, collaborators are drawing on, the approach and principles that you co-create might look very different to ours, and that is totally fine. Collaboration need not end once an output is complete or a project is ended. Shared reflection can result in further development and strengthen collaborations in very unforeseeable ways. So let these emerge, work with them, and share your, share your approaches with others. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, Nicola. That was lovely. Thank you so much. And welcome to all your co-authors that are here. I think you're the biggest group and the biggest attendance here at the, at the webinar. It's fantastic. So now we're going, we have spoken quite a bit, nearly an hour. Um, so we are going into breakout rooms now and Jacob is going to help us setting up three rooms and you can choose the room you want to attend. You can either come into the co-teaching room with myself and Yolanda, or you can go into the co-research room, Eunice will facilitate that and you'll find Nicola and her colleagues there. Or you can go into the community partnerships room that, where you, that will be facilitated by Pindila and you'll find Pauline um, in that room. So J Jacob, are you starting the breakout rooms? Okay, they're there. Um, do you all know how to get into the breakout room? I, so. You can choose, if you click on breakout rooms, you should get a little button and you should be able to, um, to enter one of the three rooms, either co-teaching, co-research or working with partners. I can see people already joining. If you, have, if you struggle, you can also tell us um, to add you directly to a room. Pauline, let me add you to room three. Have we lost Pauline? No, she's in work. Oh, fantastic. She managed to get there. If anybody's struggling, please let us know. You can put um, in the chat which group you want to join, and we can just um, move you there. Okay, bye, bye, Nadine. Please, please um, look for the book. It's you can download it for free. Let me put the link in the, into the chat. And also the link to the slides. I see quite a number of people still have not joined any of the groups yet. Please let, okay, Tsaleng wants to go into room two, okay. Done. Anybody else? Gabriel would like to, okay, go to working with partners, okay. Anybody else I need to add to a room? Okay, bye Lynette, thanks for joining us. Okay, bye Tavisa. Welcome back, everyone. It was a really nice conversation we had. Um, maybe just can I, can I ask the facilitators to give us like a one minute summary of what happened so we know what happened in the other rooms as well. Yolanda, do you want to start? Yes, thanks. Just um, briefly, um, I really, really enjoyed our session. Time was just too short, but, but fantastic uh, ideas shared. Um, uh, Stephen said, you know, every meeting started with how are you doing where you are and how are your students? It's like family, you know, it's that, that kind of connection. Then, then we had a, a 
spoke a lot about the, the importance of relationships and the process that came out more than the findings of the research. That those were really important. And then what's also struck me from what Leah said is that um, because uh, Veronica asked about underserved, for example, how do we define um, uh, you know, different um, uh, um, concepts that, that we think we understand through, through our, our um, connections and, and a co-authoring um, um, of these, these chapters, I think it's about understanding that it's, our understanding is the same, but different. So there are so many subtle nuances around a specific concept, for example, um, discovering as, as, as Leah described, underserved could mean um, economically underserved in one context could mean around uh, students being traumatized disability socioeconomic so that it opens your eyes to how others experience the same concept but so I want to say same but different um, and then uh, finally I think well the two more things that came out in our room the one was that the connection was so important and I think the routine that it gave the structure and the predictability that it gave during the pandemic we're going to meet weekly or monthly is that kind of stability that we have in our network uh, that we can rely on. Uh, and I think uh, to sum it all up, it's about the technology provided the thread to connect, how people met each other, how they, they um, built those relationships through the technology, which gave them proximity that would not have been possible without the technology. Those were the main ideas that I took down in, in our session. Thank you. Thank Daniela. you, Landa. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Nicola, do you can you could you share what happened in your group? Yes, yeah, sure. So we had a wonderful um well, few questions from a colleague, questions from a colleague at the University of the Free State. And it was around, you know, how do you um, based on challenges from her experiences, um, which then co-authors responded to, and it was around. Uh, particularly power dynamics, feeling of being online and how she felt it impedes the flow of communication. So how do we make that feel, um, how can we make it feel more natural? And then timelines, you know, when people do have different commitments or you're working across different time, time zones. So myself, Nompilo and Christy um, offered some advice. Um, and I think one of our messages that would we definitely you know, I think cut across is that it takes time. I mean, we've been working together for quite a long time since the end of 2018. And in our case, we don't have strict guidelines. Um, we also mentioned the importance of shared goals. We work together with who is available and then catch up others. And we also have a history of supporting each other. And um, we work slowly towards an end purpose. We're not very much about fast paced, it's, it's slow scholarship. I know you've, you've spoken about that before. Um, and we also connect in other spaces such as those Emerge Africa workshops and perhaps across other interests. And um, we bring ourselves, our culture into this collaboration as well. And, you know, people also, we spoke about sacrifice. So sometimes people have to give up particular things or, um, you know, to make things work. Uh, you know, meeting at a time that's not ideal, perhaps when you are tired after traveling from work, like Leia travels um, quite far. In South Africa, we've got load shedding. So those are some of the things that we discussed. And then Nadine also shared her experience mm -hmm. of line managing junior um, learning design trainees and how they're working on, um, they're doing some research together. And she shared about the mentoring involved, but also time um, constraints and how long. I think that that's one of the things that cut across that co-research does take a bit longer. Yeah. Thank you, Nicola. That's one very interesting. Pauline, could you share with your conversations in the last group? Uh, oh, could yeah. I ask Fidira um, to do that for us? She's okay, or Pindila. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they've given the task over to me. Um, yeah, they, they're working with partners, you know. Um, we've shared a few points um, that also, if someone works with the partner, you know, where an organization is bigger and yours is smaller, so you get sort of swallowed up, 
you know, mm. a bit. And uh, there are also different agendas, different perspectives, which really um, affects the working partnership in a way. And uh, also we had a solution sort of. Uh, Tony contributed that, uh, you know, you may need to know the leadership in the organization, keep you in the leadership positions and you can liaise with them. And uh, then we spoke about partnerships beyond the continents, that mm. there are challenges in agreeing to project objectives at times. However, there was also um, a plea on, sorry, sorry about that, that you know, when it comes to the whole process of conceptualizing the pro the project, it needs to be co-created, not created by one partner and then inviting you, or you mm. are there as the listening partner. You need to be an active contribution between partner and you all co-create together. And there are also concerns on um, you know, the projects objectives drifting away from the mission and vision of the organization that you work for. Mm -hmm. That may need also to be uh, reconciled. And also there was an issue on expectations from partners, especially those that are outside academia. And most of mm -hmm. the time, um, I have also had challenges when I was within community development. When working with community partners, they think you are there to implement. Mm -hmm. Instead, you are there to research and teach the students. Mm -hmm. You know, so they be looking for solutions to their problem, but you just bring solutions on paper. You may not have the resources to give out. Um, mm -hmm. And that sort of affects the partnership a bit. Mm -hmm. Although you, we would have explained beforehand, and uh, those are, are partners from the non-academic world. And uh, Prof. Jaman Paul also mentioned that uh, as an academic, we, we need to adhere to academic principles. Mm -hmm. Whereas the partner from outside academia will not be seeing it that way. And uh, there was also a call for setting clear common objectives when working with partners, even if they're from academia. So you all need to set a clear objectives and set clear terms of reference, clear deliverables, and that will help also to minimize the power. You know, when it comes to power relationships in a, a, these uh, partnerships, although the truth is that there will always be sort of some unequal partners mm -hmm. when it comes to power relations. Uh, however, the, that could be minimized, but it's something that we cannot uh, get rid of completely. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Kindila. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. So that means we we are ready for Gabriel, who is going to um, share some of his thoughts about um, from his um, from the book review he did. Gabriel, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, can you Fantastic. hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. I'm not sure I can see you. Is your is your video on? Yes, yes, you are there. Okay, thank you for joining us. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, just want to say that it's, it was quite a great experience reviewing the book for the South African Journal of Science, which will be published later in the year. So I'd encourage us to look forward to, to reading the review that I've done in the book. And I must say that it's been quite an interesting book to review. I can from the onset say that I think it's a book unlike any other that uh, I've come across when it comes to co-teaching and co-research. So in terms of the book's main message, it's really talking about network learning, how network learning can be used to connect Africa and the rest of the world. Of course, we know the context in which the book is. We just came from the COVID pandemic, which most higher education institutions 
including vocational education institutions, pivoted to online learning um, globally, though for some they didn't have the experience on how to conduct online learning and um, distance learning. So I, I feel that when one reads the book, it would give them ideas on how this can be best be done, looking at the experiences that have been shared by the various authors. The book itself provides a diversity of views and perspectives on core teaching and on core research, including conceptual and reflective papers and empirical research on African lecture, lecturers' experience with core teaching and core research courses using network learning in and beyond the African continent. So really one would ask what the contribution that the book is making is providing unique insights into opportunities and challenges when engaging in institutional and intercultural collaboration online across an equal context. I think uh, the various authors tried to show some of the ways that was done. I won't say much about the literature, but it's important if you have time to look at some of the, the literature that I've indicated here, the others. Uh, and obvious one would want to ask, does the book make its case? If you look at the preface, the book claims to provide unique insights into the opportunities and challenges when uh, authors are engaging in inter institutional in, and intercultural collaborations across an equal context. So if you go to chapter one, uh, it gives an example of where that case is made. One of them, it says, what really counts when working with you are the connections, engagement, relationships, and friendships that are formed when reaching out to and learning from colleagues beyond one's immediate context. So we see that collaboration led to co-construction of an in innovative and responsive curricula that allowed the authors to cut across cultural and institutional differences to produce this outcome. Uh, I think earlier we saw Daniela talk about that. In chapter nine, we have an example of enhancing cultural competence and enriching virtual learning experiences via a collaborative online learning project that was done. And more than 80% of the students are predominantly agreed that they acquired cultural and diversity com competence. So I see that uh, the book does make its case. One challenge, however, that has already been shared, which the students talking about, was the time difference, which was frustrating. And some felt they didn't gain anything positive from the experience. University also that had challenges with Wi-Fi uh, presented students or rather prevented students from doing uh, video calls. Next slide, please. Uh, now, what are some of the proposals or suggestions on how the book may be improved? I think one of the things that uh, maybe future, if that will be possible for a future project, is also to have voices from other parts of Africa. Uh, uh, we need maybe to hear what is happening in terms of co-teaching and co-research in Central and West Africa. If at all anything is happening, it would be great to learn what are the experiences there, the challenges, what is working and what can work. And also from Asia, having in mind countries like China, India, Malaysia, Singapore, and so on and so forth. Then also, of course, it's quite a big project. I don't think it's one that can easily be done. Others would rush into using Google Translate or other translate, translating uh, packages. But I feel that because of the value the book, the value that the book has, it would really help if it were translated into French, Portuguese, Arabic, Chinese, and many of these other uh, key languages. I think. There's a lot that can be learned from the non-English speaking uh, academic community, including policymakers and other educators. Then also, I, know, I don't know what the plans are, but apart from the book being available as a PDF 
online accessible book, I think providing links to each chapter, in my view, would make it easier to navigate through the book. Okay, we can move to the next slide. Oh, yeah. I think, I think that, that was the end that's of the last slide. <laughs> okay, so thank, <laughs> thank you so you, much. Gabriel. Yes, thank you so okay. much for your feedback, and we are looking very much forward to reading the book review. So now we have just one piece left. Um, Cheryl is here. She also read the book and the contribution. She read the forward, and we were just asking her to see what is it that we missed. You know, what is it that we should actually look at, and maybe if we think about continuing this work, what, what needs to be, um, what needs to be still written. Carol, are you there? Uh, I am indeed. And in welcome. fact, um, I think although the student voice was there and we heard some of that this morning, um, particularly from um, Nicola's group, but also from yours, Daniela, um, I think the area that we could be strengthening is around students who are marginalized in many different ways. Um, we've heard about um, some in terms of economics and trauma um, and some disability, but I think we've also got to look at language as a big issue um, because it's the sort of type of student we're having at our universities now, we need to be looking at issues around translanguaging, etc. So I think the student voice in being a co-teacher and co-developer, we need to perhaps focus on. And I think there are lots of ethical dilemmas. And I think some of the processes were mentioned today, but I think foregrounding some of the ethical issues might just help yourselves and other researchers to navigate this path a little uh, more easily. And then although they were there in some studies, um, I think what the the book could have, um, we, we, where we could strengthen is making some of the philosophical assumptions. So whether it's around reality or the values that we hold or the knowledge that we hold dear, I think we need to make those assumptions clearer and more explicit. Because I think if we do that, we might find that that's where some of our challenges are without actually naming them. They're actually mm. worldview changes. And I think that's where it can help in terms of particularly the co-research, not so much the co-teaching, but particularly the research. And then ways forward, Daniela, I'll leave you to talk about the students as partners. But I was thinking you might want to develop a little toolkit Mm -hmm. um, around some of the things that you did in a sort of very ordinary way. I mean, I've given you a link there to one we did. Mm -hmm. It was like a little tiny um, eight pager or six pager, which was kind of an instructive. And then finally, in terms of the, the philosophical assumptions, I was thinking perhaps we could arrange some web workshops in terms of helping people to unpack their philosophical assumptions. Mm -hmm. So over very to you to mention students as partners this is a project we're involved in um, we just got the funding and this is just a way of making the students more explicitly partners in the co-design facilitation and research process so we're really excited about that so that will be definitely something that we will be working more more um, with but thanks Cheryl that's really interesting and such good ideas and yeah let's let's keep talking Tony <laughs> you you had this idea of running a series of workshops around the book for the rest of the years. So maybe we can incorporate some of these ideas there. But um, we have nearly reached our end um, of the, um, the, 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 the webinar. I'm very proud. We managed in exact 90 minutes. So I'm handing over to Pimbile for a thank you and the, and, and the closing of the session. But I'd love to hear from people at Pindile um, will thank us, will we'll, we'll close the session. Um, what, what maybe one thing that you took from these 90 minutes in the chat, just post, what, what do you think really stood out for you? What can you take, um, implement in your own practice? Just post in the chat. I'd love to see that. Thank you. Pindile, do you want to take over? 
I'm muted, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I would like to thank all colleagues who have stayed with us until now and those who had joined earlier. Uh, we appreciate your time and all the contributions from you. We really appreciate that. And uh, I hope you join us for the workshops in the future when we organize them. And uh, thank you again for the enthusiasm in the book. And we trust that you will also make others, other partners out there aware of the book. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um... Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Pindile. I will share the slides in the in the um, chat, and I think J Jacob will also send them out with the um, with the with the recording of this meeting. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Jacob, <laughs> for hosting us. It was lovely having this book launch as part of Emerge because I know Emerge, that is the core of what you do is to support co-teaching, co-research and collaboration. That was really lovely to see you all. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Cheryl, for your input. Thank you, Thank you to all the chapter authors who were here. Thank Thanks a million. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This was phenomenal. Um, and really, it testament to the amazing work done by the editors and the authors of the book and a real celebration of community and a way to continue growing community. Um, so I love the facilitation design that the editors brought to this event as well, a real instructive model on how to do a virtual book launch. Mm. So thank you. And hoping to host more events um, as Emerge Africa, as partners to this process. Um, the conversation will continue. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you.